Good luck. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those joining us from various parts of the world. My name is Philomena Apico, and my policy officer at the European Centre for Development Policy, ECDBM in short, working in the African Institutions and Regional Dynamics Programme. I welcome you all. From the list, I can see that at the moment we are at 24 participants. So allow me just uh, two more minutes to allow some more people to join before I proceed with the agenda for the webinar. But in the meantime, before we begin, I would like to share some housekeeping rules with all of you. Please keep yourself muted and your video off during the presentations to allow for easier interaction between the, the speaker and the moderator. Sound, I can barely hear you. The sound is very low. Hello, can you hear me better now? No, the sound has become very, very low. Let me try with some headphones in. Just give me a minute. Hello, can you hear me better now? I can hear you loud and clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, as I was saying, um, before we begin, I would please like to share some housekeeping rules with you. Please keep yourselves muted and your videos off during the, the duration of the presentations to allow for easy exchange between the moderator and the speakers. Participants are welcome to ask questions using the chat button located at the bottom of your screen during the course of the webinar. So with that said, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar series. Just to mention that ECDPM is organizing a series of webinars on the broad theme of connecting African markets and people under the African continental free trade area. Given the high ambitions attached to the ASCFJ process and the rising interest among international partners, in supporting its implementation, the aim of the series is to focus on some key AFCFTA objectives to discuss the policies and politics and how those objectives can be made. Today is the first webinar in the series of three, and other two webinars are scheduled for later this month and early November. The, the second webinar is scheduled for 29th of October this month, so feel free to, 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 to also engage with us on that day. And this webinar will focus on the AFCFTA and the continent to continent trade with the European Union. Just a brief um, his, uh, history of, of, of where this project comes from. Over the last year, under the project titled Political Economic Dynamics of Region Organization, Pedro in short, with financial support from the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, ECDPM has been following the AFCFTA process as it unfolds asking questions on what it will take to meet the promise it seems to offer, and analyzing how to more effectively make the link between the AFCFTA agenda and the free movement protocol, which as some of you may know, were, were both signed on the same, at the same time. But the free movement protocol has to date received much less political attention than the AFCFTA process, which is why we're here today. Our first webinar focuses on the AFCFTA free movement of people and the regional economic communities. One of the objectives of the AFCFC is to simplify trading within the African continent, where most countries are members of multiple trading regimes. However, to what degree can this really be achieved while building on the RECs and the regional setups? And how are these relations and how are these relations supported or undermined by the free movement of, of people, given the regional protocols in place in some regions are more advanced than others? 
and what are the policy implications of this complex reality for regional organizations, for national governments, and the private sector? And where and how do we see the AFCFCA and the free movement protocol processes helping to create traction for existing regional processes? This is why we're here today, ladies and gentlemen. At ECDPM, we are interested in moving from policy to practice and to focus on the practicalities of, of implementation. The aim of today's webinar is not to have formal positions, but rather to have a frank discussion on the reality checks regarding the, rationali the rationalization of RECs and the free movement protocol and how this will impact the ACT implementation in practice. So today I am joined by a panel of distinguished speakers who will delve into some of these issues. We will first hear a presentation from my colleague Amanda Song before I open up the floor to the speakers on our panel. So our first presenter today will be discussing the findings of ECDPM's report looking at the topic of today's webinar. Um, I'll just briefly introduce my colleague Amanda. Amanda previously has worked at GIZ as the head of trade and, and, and customs units. She's currently a policy officer in ECDPM's migration program. She has uh, worked in, in, in various research areas focusing on migration agreements, labor migration, exploring the linkages between trade and migration in Africa, migration governance, and the interplay between regional and national commitments. Amanda, you have about 12 minutes, me being generous as the moderator, to share with us your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lamina. Um, if you could just uh, share the, the slides, please. Thank you very much. Um, so as Philomena has already introduced our project, uh, Pedro, I won't go so much into, into details on that. What we, what we were looking at in this piece of research was how to link uh, markets and people, because in the discourse surrounding the AFCFTA, we've heard a lot about the AFCFTA creating opportunities for people on the continent and the agreement also um, facilitating the movement of goods, services, and people. And so this was something we wanted to explore, uh, trying to look at what this means in reality, starting from the basis of the agreements, looking at the AFCFTA and the AU Free Movement Protocol, and moving on to what is obtainable in practice and what policymakers would need to bear in mind if they want to move from the current situation of things in um, to what the objectives of the to achieving the objectives of the AFCFTA. Next slide, please. So I'll start with uh, my presentation with an outline uh, of the vision for connecting. Excuse uh, me, your uh, voice is very weak. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start uh, with the vision for connecting markets and people, um, looking also at the rationale for uh, rationalizing um, uh, markets, uh, sorry, for rationalizing regional agendas, uh, focusing on reducing overlaps and linking markets and people. And then I'll look at uh, moving from policy to practice, what it means when we talk about connecting markets and people, and then I'll conclude with the implications for practitioners and policymakers. And after that, we'll open it up for debate uh, and discussions and comments from, from the panelists. So basically, when we talk about the vision of connecting markets and people, we can trace it to Agenda 2063, which looks at achieving an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa. And then the AFCFTA, also as part of its objectives, aims to create a single market for goods, services, facilitated by movement of persons in order to deepen the economic integration of the African continent. So we already see that from the FCFTA agreements, there is this link between markets and movement of people. And the focus here is on the economic integration. Um, which is also linked to the regional economic integration agendas that exist in the various RECs across the continent. Now, AFCFTA is projected to um, yeah. connect 1.3 billion people um, across 55 countries. Sorry, next slide, please. AFCFTA is, is projected to um, connect 1.3 billion people across 55 countries with a combined GDP of 3.4 trillion, and it's estimated to lift about 30 million people out of poverty. And on the 
people's side, the AFCFTA is expected to create at least uh, 14 to 16 million new jobs in manufacturing. So the question then for us is how to link these opportunities, uh, um, potential opportunities that AFCFTA creates with actual uh, um, a movement of people and actual realization of, of these opportunities. And um, one of the things that we sought to, to also look at was how the AFCFTA and the Free Movement Protocol would change the existing incentives around the relationships that exist between states when it comes to the movement of persons and, uh, and trade relations. Next slide, please. So if we look deeply at the rationale for rationalizing the different agreements, um, the AFCFTA has the objective to resolve the challenges of multiple and overlapping memberships and expedite regional and continental uh, integration processes. This is one of the main uh, um, rationales for rationalizing the, the different REC agendas that exist at the continental level. But the agreement also recognizes that the regional economic communities serve as the building blocks and it also formally recognizes the preservation of the key and the best practices from the REX as two of its guiding principles. But in reality, what we have seen is that there's a duplication of limited resources. So when it comes to allocation of staff and financial resources, there's a duplication of these limited resources between the REC agendas and continental agenda. There's also inconsistency in policies, especially where you have overlaps between uh, membership of several RECs. Um, also, it has resulted in some form of venue shopping with uh, um, uh, states choosing which policies to implement. And in cases where um, they are members of two customs unions or two potential customs unions, choosing between which customs union to belong to. So this slide presents like an overview of uh, the next slide, please. Next slide, please. This slide presents like an overview of the overlapping um, uh, regional trade. No, previous slide. Thank you. Presents like an overview of the overlapping uh, regional trade agreements that exist uh, in, 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 on the continent. And what we can see is overlapping memberships. And so what we tried to also explore what, was what does this mean, these overlapping uh, uh, regional trade agreements, what does this mean for the AFCFTA if the aim and objective of the AFCFTA is to try to rationalize these various trade agreements that exist uh, on the continent. The next slide, please. On the side of, of movement of people, again, we start from the premise that the AFCFTA aims to facilitate the movement of people and contribute to the movement of capital and natural persons. Uh, building on the different initiatives and developments that it already exist at the REC level. And if we look at policy, the policy space, we've had several policymakers and several uh, uh, heads of states in their speeches talk about linking markets and people, and uh, also talk about industrialization that is needed on the continent, the amount of job creation that is needed, and also the need to protect the, the livelihoods of small and medium cross-border traders. And uh, more broadly, the ability of young and skilled African workers to take up employment opportunities that are available in other African countries created by the AFCFTA. So this means that there has to be a way for young skilled African workers to move from their country of origin to countries of destination on the continent where these employment opportunities exist. So this is the link between the AFCFTA and the free movement protocol, because while the AFCFTA uh, does indeed contain uh, uh, um, and, and, and it's currently being negotiated now, the, the services schedules, 
um, and, and 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 also contains a, 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 um, a, it also covers trade and services. However, this is not this doesn't extend to all categories of workers, and they're not able and not all people are able to move freely on that AFCFTA. And so you need to equally consider the free movement protocol. But we see we see these discussions and these narratives, but moving from this policies and and narratives and discussions to practice in in, in it, it faces a series of of of, of challenges um, also when we look at, at mobility in in practice what we see is that there is restricted mobility so for example talking about this uh, young african workers who would want to move they need visas to to move to about 46 percent of of african countries and also looking at the 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 looking at the interest of states uh, we see more interest in terms of the AFCFTA than on the free movement protocol. So we have 38 ratifications of the AFCFTA, but on the free movement protocol, we have four ratifications. And so we see this disconnect between um, linking markets and people. And for us, we decided to explore a bit why a bit more why this exists. Um, next slide, please. So this slide shows the different um, the different uh, uh, um, uh, regional economic uh, communities that exist, also the different trading areas and the countries that require visas for people to be able to access. The next slide, please. And on the next slide, we also, and on this slide, we also see the different, uh, the signatories of the AU protocol, the different RECs that exist uh, um, on the continent that have some sort of free movement protocols and uh, and also uh, um, the different overlaps that exist when it comes to the free movement protocol. Next slide, please. So in practice, what we see is that there are several overlaps that exist uh, between the RECs, not only in the area of trade, but also in the area of, of free movement of people. And uh, what does this mean uh, for the AFCFTA if we're actually moving towards connecting markets and people? So first of all, the agreement is we need to build on the RECs. And this, what this means in practice is that intra-REC trade will continue. And so you don't have now new regimes for intra-REC trade. Um, the, the, the negotiations on the AFCFTA will cover extra rec trade, so that's trade between member states in different recs. And it's the same thing for free movement of persons, right? Because within several recs, you already have this free movement of persons protocols. But what the AU free movement of persons protocol would govern would be movement uh, of, of citizens from one rec to member states of another rec. Uh, and these are things that would need to be considered, given that if we look at the next point, which is on ev even regional building blocks, these RECs are at different levels of trade liberalization and also at different levels of achieving uh, free movement. However, the agreement uh, uh, makes provision for variable geometry. But what does this mean in practice in terms of implementing the AFCFTA agreement and also in terms of implementing the free movement protocol? Both agreements make uh, make ha have the have have uh, the provisions of variable geometry. But what does this mean in practice? And we hope to delve into this some more during the discussions. Again, we look at the regions and the continental setup. Um, their roles for the RECs, the roles for the AU, the roles for AFCFTA Secretariat, and the member states need to be clarified, especially given the existing overlaps between the different RECs and the options for venue shopping and the options uh, for, for inconsistent and the existence of inconsistent policies, all these need to be clarified. And so looking into the in institutional setup, what roles will the RECs play? What roles will the member states play? And what roles will the AU Commission and the, and the AFCFTA Secretariat equally play? This have a lot of implications in terms of moving from the policies to the practice. Again, looking at the level of the private sector, what we see is that the, um, 
that AFCFTA in some cases creates an additional burden because we have this parallel system that is now established in addition to existing intra-REC uh, intra trading regimes. What does this mean for the private sector? Does this create an additional level of complexity for the private sector? How will the private sector address this? Also, is the private sector being supported in identifying possible opportunities that exist under the AFCFTA and possible threats that also exist? These are some of the things that we looked into. Of course, we look at uh, the trade in services uh, negotiations that are going on and the free movement of persons, like we said, most times uh, in the, tr the trading services covers a lot of categories of workers. However, when we look at the uh, small and, and medium scale uh, uh, cross border traders, these are not covered by the trading services, but these are essential to the economies of most of the countries. So looking at the at the free movement of and, and the ability for these people to to be able to 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 facilitate for the movement to be able to be facilitated from one country to another is important also as part of the economic uh, integration agenda, which the FCFTA seeks to achieve. And when we look at connecting uh, markets and people, there are also lots of uh, um, national interests here at stake. And what we see in practice is also that states use different recs to meet their national interests. What does this mean in terms of, of rationalizing the overlaps between the various recs? This is something that needs to be also taken um, into consideration. Next slide, please. Well, finally, looking at the implication for policymakers, our recommendations are that policymakers uh, should adapt uh, their supports to this complex reality of, of regional organizations, national governments, and the private sector in three areas. So first of all, where the AFCFTA and free movement processes can help create traction for existing regional processes, because it's obvious that there will still be existing regional processes with intra-REC and uh, uh, inter -mo in, in, internal mobility within REC still existing. Secondly, where the existing regional processes can be built upon to support the AFCFTA implementation, because looking at the objective of building on the key and learning from the best practices from RECs. And thirdly, helping the private sector and others to adjust to the potential threats and opportunities from the AFCFTA within and between RECs and regional groupings. Again, this is looking at that level of additional complexity that the AFCFTA might create and addressing it at that level. Next slide, please. So in conclusion from our report, what we found, what we found from our study is that implementation of the AFCFTA and the free movement protocol would require additional efforts by policy members, sorry, by policymakers to ensure coordination and synergies on the institutional side for clarifying the roles and also clarifying the roles for uh, on the institutional side for clarifying the roles of the various actors. So the RECs, member states, uh, AUC and AFCFTA uh, secretariat, and also providing clarity for the private sector on what are the benefits uh, that can be ripped uh, from, from, the, from the agreement. So looking into the opportunities and the threats that exist. Uh, and specific AUAFCFTA re regional organization relations need to be tailored according to the level of integration, since we also found that there are different levels of integration uh, across the RECs. And so it also should be tailored to these levels of integration and to the strengths and weaknesses of the various RECs. And this depends and this depends on, on the, the, the capacity of the RECs. Of, of, of course, this will add another layer of complexity to the policy landscape, but it's something that needs to be done. And lastly, uh, policymakers should also move towards uh, facilitating the mobility of various categories of persons, such as business persons, migrant workers, uh, uh, students and tourists, in order to take advantage of the opportunities that are presented uh, uh, by, the, by the AFCFT. Uh, Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to engaging discussions. And just to remind you, you can already start with your questions on the chat. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing this really insightful and comprehensive study, really laying out for us, you know, setting the pace for today's discussions. And I also have to commend you, you were only two minutes uh, um, over time, so I think <laughs> we can see that timekeeping is, is already off to a good start today. 
So uh, thank you so much for this. As we have heard from your presentation, there, there were clear um, rationales for, for, for wanting to reduce the overlap of, of, of membership uh, in terms of the RECs, but also linking markets and people. But when we go, when we go into practice, we find that there's some reality checks that need to be addressed before implementation can proceed. Of course, one of the issues would be coordination and synergies in the institutional setup, the roles of the different RECs vis-a-vis -vis the AUC Commission, vis-a-vis -vis the ACT Secretariat, but also member states and the private sector need to be clarified before implementation can go forward. And then also the reality that you've just given us that different RECs are at, at different levels of, of integration, so this uneven regional building blocks means that they're not homogeneous in the way that they should be addressed. So what, what does this mean in practice? And I think from this departure, I can then now introduce our panel for today. We are joined by three experts who will be discussing um, some of these key topics and really delving into how we can translate from policy into practice. The first panelist that we'll hear from today is Dr. Wumi Olaiwola, who is a program officer and director of research and statistics at the ECOWAS Commission. Dr. Olaiwola is a trade economist with extensive research in macroeconomic policy, international trade, and economic integration issues. He's currently a faculty member of the Trade Policy Training in, 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 uh, in Africa, located in Arusha, also known as TRAPCA, as well as a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics and Development Studies at the Covenant University in Nigeria. Dr. Wumi has consulted for a number of international organizations, including UNDP, GIZ, USAID, World Bank Group, and GINECA. And also, for those of you who have had the honor of reading his uh, wonderful publication, he's the author of the comprehensive and very insightful study on governing the interface between the AFCFCA, the RECs, uh, looking at the issues, opportunities, and challenges. This is why we're very honored to have him today as one of the panelists, and it's very fitting that he follows Amanda's presentation to sort of um, also highlight some of the, 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 the key questions she asked. She asked a question about, for example, what does variable geometry mean in practice? So from, from you, Dr. Wumi, as you respond to um, Amanda's presentation, I would like to also throw some specific questions. From what we've heard today, whether than rationalizing trade agreements, CFTA is actually adding a set of trade regimes among the RECs and the free trade areas. So what kind of efforts need to be made by policymakers at the national, regional, and continental levels in order to ensure that the objective of rationalizing trade agreement is achieved. And even to add more to this, I will bring in the private sector angle. How does the current lack of clarity affect the private sector in practice? Dr. Wumi, the floor is yours. Philomena, thank you very much. And I need to really thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, to thank you, ECDPM, for counting the body to make contribution in this kind of topic I use. But within the limited time given to me, I hope I can be able to do justice to all this you asked me to do. But definitely I will start from the conclusion of uh, Amanda presentation. But I just want to remind us again that if we look at the landmass of India and that of Africa, it's nearly the same thing. For why India is just only one country, and here is Africa is a 55 countries. So when we are talking about institutions, we are talking about 55 institutions plus numerous regional economic community, and also numerous other institutions. But the joy here is that we are the AFCFTA that try as much as possible to harmonize all these numerous trade regimes. But let me quickly remind us that a well-defined trade rule is not as that important compared to a well-implemented rule. From my experience, I've seen that it's easier for our countries to sign and ratify any kind of trade agreement to implement is the most challenging. I think Amanda has done justice to but what I just want to do is to see how can we move from the practice, uh, from the principle to the practice, and how we can be able to make sure the potential the AFP is achieving. That's why we just try and run over 
my discussion based on those three major aspects. Why do we need this? And if you know that, how can we do that and when? Let me begin by saying that the major challenge of multiplicity of trade regimes mainly is borne by the private sector. As we all know, governments do not trade, only private sector does. And they are the receiving hand in the sense that if we can be able to see numerous regional economic committee we have, even apart from the eight recognized one, there are many numerous ones that have a lot of influence. Another one that were recognized by the taking more in the time of Equus, look at SAKU in Sadek and look at uh, SEMAC in Ekas. So because of this multiplicity of trade regime, I can tell you that Africa has one of the highest trade costs in the world. In the world. From the study of Unica, Hello? We're not, we, we lost you there for, we, we lost you for a minute, for a second, actually. Hello? Okay, um, I will just de defer to my, my colleagues who, who are helping out with the IT to get Dr. Wumi's connection. In the meantime, I can move on to the second speaker for today. We'll wait for Dr. Wumi to regain connection. Allow me to introduce Dr. Francis Mangeni, who is currently an advisor to the ASCFJ Secretariat and a senior fellow of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance in Cape Town. He has worked and consulted extensively on the multilateral trade system and African economic integration. His past position include the head of programs at the ASCFTA as well as Director of Trade, Customs and Monetary Affairs with COMESA. It's all similarly consulted with various hello. international organizations. Um, hello, Dr. Wimi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine now. Hello? Uh, Dr. Wimi, I can hear you. Please proceed. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes, I can hear you perfectly, okay. Dr. Wimmy. Yes. Thank you very much. And we see in the Amanda Right. Amanda Right, only Commerce and EAC has been able to reduce the tariff on intermediate tools. And I'm able to see that if AFCFTA is not well implemented, as Amanda has really said the other time, in the private sector, that we bear the cost. We seem to have lost Dr. Wumi again. Uh, Dr. Wumi, if you'll allow me, let me proceed with Dr. Francis in the meantime, and we'll get back to you once your connection is stable. As I was saying uh, concerning Dr. Francis Mangeni, he has also consulted with various international regional organizations, such as UNECA, UNCTAD, the ILO, the Commonwealth Secretariat, South Center, East African Community, and SADC. He brings with him a wealth of knowledge, both on the continental, regional, and national level. So we're very honored to have him today. Uh, Dr. Francis, my question to you would be, following from Amanda's presentation, you have heard for the need for more coordination amongst the continental level and the regional level. And also, as Dr. Wumi was highlighting before his connection was cut off, this is quite key. So from you, I would like to understand and also to find out what role does the AFCFC Secretariat play in ensuring coordination between the continental and regional levels towards implementation of the AFCFT? Of course, coordination between the, the, the REC level and the, and the institution is not a new thing, but we have seen in the past that coordination hasn't always gone smoothly. So how can we avoid those shortcomings of the past going forward? And how can the various actors, for example, the AUC Commission, member states, international partners, donors, also be able to support the, the Secretariat in better playing this role? Dr. Francis, the floor is yours. 
Uh, good morning. Can you? I believe you can hear me, and you can see me. Yes, so, I can hear congratulations you. Uh, to you, can you hear me now? Uh, Philomena Pika. Oh, oh, Miss back again. So, <laughs> what do we do? Should I proceed, or should we listen to me first? Uh, Umi, this is the second yes. time you have you're coming in and then getting cut. I've changed my Wi Fi source. Sorry. So, I don't know whether. Can I, can I make some. Yeah. Um, can I, do you mind? Can I make some remarks? Umi, can I make some remarks? And then uh, after that, you can come in. Okay. Okay, right. that is better. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Francis. You can proceed. Wumi? Yes, it's okay. You can continue. Okay. But I want some of the issues is what I want you to address. Oh, okay. So, so it's 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 it seems that the um, it seems that, that Dr. Wumi has some 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 questions that he would like Dr. Francis to address. So maybe let's yeah. give him a, a third chance, third chance. <laughs> Three times okay. the charm, they say. <laughs> so let's hope that your connection is stable now so we can get the conversation flowing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will quickly round up my presentation. To me, what I think uh, the collaboration of all these policymakers at the national, regional, and continental level to focus on, and that's what I just want to see, maybe it's just like agenda setting, is that the platforms to be used on how to design, how to overcome the challenges of various regional economic community to, in the term of implementation of the IAFCFTA, and how to be able to create a conducive environment for them to be able to partake in the implementation of the AFCFTA. The basic question now, is how that one can be done. First of all, there may be the need for us to understand the heterogeneity nature of our various regional economic community that produce all the relevant FTAs. And also, it should be a platform where we can be able to have common understanding of various provisions of the AFCA that needs some kind of reconciliation. And it may be supposed to be a platform where we can have interpretative notes. Let me start some example. Rex, as a building block of AEC, and Rex FTA as a building block for the AFC FTA. If I can understand that one very well, that means Rex FTA should be the block in which the building of AFC FTA should be built. But these are blocks that are not of the same size and they are not of the same dimension. Can we have a durable house out of that kind of image? How can we reconcile Article 19 and Article 5? To me, I believe higher order of integration should indicate one major fact that is it the one in principle or the one in practice? I believe it is the, the higher order of integration that's been implemented that's supposed to be considered, not the one that's just in design. That's what I think this platform needs to be used in order to be able to address that. And that kind of platform should also be able to now to unbundle the Rex and Rex FTAs. Because if you look at various FTAs of various Rex, they have different provisions. Let me set an example. I believe for those regions who submit their schedule of, uh, of uh, tariff concessions, let me use an example of ECOWAS. I, I'm not sure that schedule being submitted for AFCFTA can be able to address that three powerful document that Nigeria is using to implement ECOWAS CET. So when you have import adjustment tax, you have import prohibition list, you have a national list. How is that kind of thing going to impact on the implementation of ASCFT? As we all know, ECOWAS has 5,899 tariff lines. Some of these tariff lines, Nigeria created additional control on some of them. How are we going to deal with that? And I think that's what the platform is supposed to be able to 
to, to, to address the rules of rules of origin and so on and so forth. So when we are setting up the objective for this kind of platform of these institutions, I think the area of addressing trade complementarity and also the area of reducing policy diversity should be the focus. So any kind of arrangement needs to be program based. And here, our boosting inter-African trade needs to come to place. How do we involve all these institutions at the regional level, at the national level, and at the continental level to implement that kind of action plans? And if that's why we're supposed to have what we do is strategic action plan towards the implementation of the area of trade policy, trade facilitation, productive efficiency. That's what I think that as a platform, we need to think outside the box. And even possible, let's throw out the box. Can we focus on sectoral integration? Then will the private sector come to place? And then negotiate with them at sectoral level. And look at the possibility of developing the value chain and the supply chain. And the public sector not just be ordinary facilitator. I think this is one of those things that we can be able to do and see how can we use that collaborative platform to develop continental multilateral corporations to provide platform for continental supply chain. These are those things that we are supposed to be supposed to try as much as we to think about. And also business information services. That's what I think is supposed to be part of the agenda that we can think of when we are dealing with that kind of uh, platform. To me, to be be the best way to manage change is success. I believe that you can have a collaborative effort to be able to implement AFCFT very well, and we can be able to achieve some kind of uh, out outcome. It will serve as an incentive for all regional economic community in order for to rationalize some of the FTAs. So this is the reason why, let me conclude by saying, when should we do that? It is now. Now, that is where we need to create a platform for effective implementation. So the role assignment for all different institutions should be based on the principle of subsidiarity. That is why I want to commend the efforts of the AU in developing the AU framework for division of labor. For this thing needs to be finalized, but it has to be measured by tangible outcome. And what we need to do is that to allocate functions to different institutions in which they have the capacity to implement. So this is just what I just want to add to this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wumi. Indeed, three, the third time was a charm and we were able to hear you loud and clear. Raised very, very interesting points that I think will um, shape the discussion with Dr. Francis. From, from, from you, I had uh, key points on trade complementarity. How do you ensure that the national, regional, and continental frameworks are working, as well as collaboration based on, sus on subsidiarity, really looking at the framework and, and how this can also take into account RECs, but also the private sector. So from this, I would like to then um, pose the question to Dr. Francis, as I asked before. I can repeat the question as well for you. What role does the AFCFTA Secretariat play in ensuring coordination between the continental and regional levels towards the implementation of the AFCFTA? As we've heard from Dr. Wumi, we need collaboration that takes into account the heterogeneity of the different RECs, as well as ensure trade complementarity and collaboration based on subsidiarity. And adding to this, how can the various actors, that's the AUC, the member states, international partners, as well as RECs, uh, support the AFC Secretariat in better playing this role? From what we've heard uh, from, from Dr. Wumi's presentation, we, we definitely need to, to, to be able to have a concrete framework, a platform as he called it. What, what steps are being taken? Where are we with the, with, with the framework for division of labor between the RECs and the AFC Secretariat? Will there be a protocol in future? What can we expect in terms of collaboration? Dr. Francis, the floor is yours. Right, thank you again. Let me give you another go. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say how glad I am to be participating in this uh, uh, event. Uh, congratulations to you, ECDF, 
uh, CDPM for organizing it. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Wumi, my brother, was able to actually correct, uh, you know, get his, uh, his IT uh, team to help fix the uh, hitches he was facing. And uh, for him to have made that in intervention, which I found very informative, very educative, and uh, actually paves, you know, the way for maybe some of the remarks I'm going to make. I, I also appreciate the comments I'm seeing in the chat box. Like I have seen uh, a comment on what's the role for uh, partners, and uh, I'd like to say upfront that there is room for all people of goodwill, all organizations of goodwill around the world who would like to come on board to assist uh, us, to work with us as Africa in uh, implementing uh, the AFCFTA and all its uh, programs. I have also seen comments by Alan, uh, which are very, very helpful, very constructive. He asked a question, but also provided some very nice, uh, very constructive suggestions, like having technical committees between the AU and the range joint committee, which I think is a, a nice collaborative framework for addressing some of the issues that uh, uh, we face. Now, Philo, in response to your question, uh, we would like to start by recalling that uh, from the Kagame report, you remember uh, President Kagame proposed some fundamental reforms for the African Union. We came up with the idea of a media coordination summit. So around July, June, or June, from June, July to August, uh, the African Union normally holds these days what's called a media coordination summit which is not a summit of all the 55 countries, but it's a summit of only the presidents who are chairing the eight regional economic communities, as well as the secretaries of those regional economic communities, together, of course, with the other organizations that support regional integration, like the African Development Bank, the Economic Commission for Africa. So this is a, a primary framework for coordination. Uh, of the RECs and their efforts, and of course, channeling them towards the continental integration process. Uh, we have had uh, a few of them already, and we are going to have another one uh, next month. Then the second thing to say is that uh, the AFCFTA Secretariat has now started a system of convening the regional economic communities. And uh, that a framework provides then a, a very intimate, uh, uh, shall I say, occasion for the regional economic communities at the level of the heads of the secretariats, and of course the head of the AFCFTA secretariat and the secretary general himself and his team, uh, to exchange views. For instance, about two weeks ago, there was such an event uh, which actually kicked off this uh, series of events which, is going to, which are going to be taking place from time to time. Uh, I would say regularly, frequently, in fact, in order to work intimately together. So that's the second point to make that uh, now the AFCFTA Secretariat and the Secretaries of the Regional Economic Communities uh, will be meeting regularly and have already held one meeting. Now, at that meeting, there was participation by industry or the private sector, as well as some international organizations like the African Development Bank, uh, the African as well as the Economic Commission for Africa, and of course the African Union Commission itself. Now, uh, the outcome, the main outcome from that first inaugural uh, event was that it was the proposal that we should have a continental task force, more or less a joint secretariat made up of the AFCFTA secretariat, the regional economic communities, the private sector, and the partner institutions to provide secretariat services for continental. Uh, integration. And of course, the legal status of the regional economic communities is going to be clarified that uh, they are active participants in the AFCFTA project. Now, what's going to happen next, and the Secretary General pointed this out at that meeting, is that a coordinator for regional economic communities is going to be appointed by the Secretary General, and uh, that coordinator will be located in his office to coordinate, of course, the regional economic communities. There will also be a head for AFCFTA advisors, and there will be an AFCFTA advisor in each of the regional economic communities around the continent. So now this will be an organic system uh, for 
the regional economic communities to work together with each other, but as well as with the AFC FTA uh, secretariat, so that things are not left to chance or a fourth or trial. Now, next is that um, going forward, what we see happening is that um, the regional economic communities are going to more or less be a system of uh, local government, so to speak, if you just uh, if you can use that uh, expression as just a holding exp expression, in the context of the African continent of free trade area uh, framework. According to Article 5 of the agreement, there are three principles which uh, uh, we may refer to. Uh, the regional economic communities are building blocks. We shall build on their key as we move forward. And then the best practices of the regs uh, will be used. In addition to that, we have Article 19, which recognizes that the deeper levels of integration achieved by the regional economic communities will not be rolled back. Rather, they will be built upon so that the regional economic communities that have attained le uh, deeper levels of integration will more or less be fast tracks for the African continent of free trade area in various areas, such as trade liberalization, such as movement of persons, such as services, and so on and so forth. So we believe that going forward, uh, there should be this system of working very closely uh, together, and uh, we believe the framework is in place. Now, Philo, you mentioned that in the past this hasn't worked, but I believe that uh, with the African continent of free trade area in place, there is a high momentum around continental integration now uh, at the highest political level, the level of heads of state and government. So we can expect that the problems we had in the past will be uh, resolved expeditiously, should they crop up uh, again. I think that's the guarantee that uh, we can uh, look uh, up to uh, in terms of uh, addressing any challenges that uh, come forward. But uh, can I end then where I started? that uh, the AFCFTA is uh, supposed to be inclusive. The Secretary General mentions practically at every occasion that we want an inclusive FTA where all, all stakeholders come on board, all people of goodwill come on board and we work together. It has to be green, of course, because of the climate change uh, impetus. It has to be modern, of course, because we live in the fourth industrial revolution. So digitalization, digitization, will be extremely uh, important. It has to be functional because implementation will be a critical success factor for achieving the objectives that we want to achieve. So all the, all the institutions, including dispute settlement mechanisms, uh, as well as the committees, whether it's really got trade in goods, trade in services, and reviews, must be operation, operational. And of course, at the national level, we need full ownership by all stakeholders in the public sector, in industry or the private sector, in civil society, grassroots organizations, as well as uh, academia. And to this end, we have got national AFCFTA strategies. At the moment, more than 40 countries have prepared these strategies with the help of the Economic Commission of Africa, which are supposed to help the countries to benefit maximally from the AFCFTA. So I hope I can end there, and I hope I've been able to answer maybe a few of your questions which you asked. But please, let's be optimistic, and let us learn from the past and try to work together. This spaghetti ball, uh, we can now eat it, in fact, because with the AFCFCA, I don't think we have those problems of rationalization that we were talking about in the past. We have now been able to come up with a framework that brings the regional economic communities together to work together with each other as well as with the continental institutions as we move forward uh, in one direction thank you back to you philo thank you so much dr francis for your intervention definitely raised some really key questions i think a lot of us had in terms of how this framework was going to be structured between the RECs and the afcfta you mentioned that uh, this time the legal status of the RECs will be clarified. And I think this is an important factor that, that we need to keep in, in mind is that if we, if we initially look at the agreement itself, RECs merely had an advisory role 
Uh, but now it seems that their efforts to more concretize the role of the regs in the institutional setup. So this is, I think, an optimistic point of view for, for us to take away from, from your intervention today. I also um, really appreciated um, finding out more about the various ways to, to establish advisors at the RECs, you know, working together with the Secretariat, as well as to also hear about the progress of the national AFCFCA strategies, which really look at the national level and trying to link this to the regional and continental levels. Uh, however, I think also we need to be realistic as well with the expectations that could come out of this. Yes, you said that the, the framework is in place, but lessons of the past also do teach us some of their shortcomings that we should be able to avoid. And just to get maybe clarification from you, when you say Rex in this instance, who are you referring to? It is only the eight recognized Rex. What about the, the other um, customs unions that, that, that play a role in, in the AFCFT negotiations? What about, for example, the tripartite free trade area? What is the status of this within the AFCFT institution setup? Maybe shed some light first on that. Uh, yeah, right, yes. I'm really glad you have brought that up. I'm sorry I didn't touch on it. Yes, in 2006, eight regional economic communities were recognized by the African uh, Union. And I think these are well known, uh, all from the South, uh, SADC, EESC, EGAD, ECAS in Central Africa, ECOWAS, uh, and then AMU in North Africa, as well as Censored, which has been dominant now uh, for some time. Now, uh, that excluded some of the customs unions, which are actually quite vibrant and uh, efficacious on the continent, such as SACU, uh, such as uh, uh, ECAS, uh, but though we had a Sorry, CEMAC, though we had a case, and the uh, more. Now, what has been agreed going forward is that these customs unions will now be on board. So, this continental task force, this uh, coordination meetings that the FCFTA secretariat is going to be convening uh, with the REC secretariats at the level of heads of the organizations, will also have these uh, other organizations participating. SACU, uh, ECAS, uh, or CEMAC, and then UEMO, uh, as well as, of course, EAC, which is a recognized regional economic community, but it's also a customs union. So to answer your question then, this will be on board. They will not be left out anymore. And it has to be so, because in the AFCFTA negotiations, customs territories or customs unions who are customs territories have had to provide joint offers. Uh, we have a, a joint offer from uh, SACU, of course, from ESC, from ECOWAS, as well as from CEMAC. So it has to be so. There's no other way around it. Thank you. Back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for, for clarifying. And I think it's it's really important for us to understand who will be the players, you know, within this institute framework. So it's good to see that also the other customs unions are included in their negotiations. I will now move on to the third speaker for today. I've, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat being posted towards the free movement protocol. So we're excited to have with us today, Mr. Emmanuel Bansa, Deputy Executive Director of the AFCFTA Policy Network for Ghana and Diaspora. He, he is a trained ECOWAS and AU policy analyst who was also pioneered ECOWAS 40 podcast in 2015. In addition to this, Emmanuel was recently nominated as one of the four APRM champions at the APRM Communications Forum in Nairobi in September this year. And as well as a few weeks ago, he was elected as country champion for Ghana for Nepad Auda. So Emmanuel, we're really, really honored to have you here with your experience as well to share with us some of your insights concerning the free movement of protocol. For you, I have a specific question also looking at the questions in the chat. How can the AU protocol on the free movement of people benefit from the traction surrounding the CFTA? As shared by Amanda, we have 38 versus four ratifications. Really, this number is really low considering that this protocol is also necessary to, to be able to bring more integration within the continent. And what can be done to facilitate the movement of people, especially as it, re it relates to maximizing the available opportunities which the AFCFTA creates? Uh, Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Good morning, uh, Philomena and uh, ACDPM. Thank you very much for uh, a, a great series. Uh, we hope to be participating and interacting more on, on these kind of engagements. Uh, so specifically to answer your, your questions, I think I think you you, you said that the, it's it's low, the freedom of movement protocol um, 
the ratifications are low. I wouldn't use low. I would be a, a, a bit more provocative. I, I think I think it's 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 atrocious. I mean, how is it possible that you have two uh, important protocols? You have the after protocol, then you have the free freedom of movement, all in the same year. You have one moving very quickly, uh, mobilized very quickly with all sorts of stakeholders, and then you have another one which is very critical, uh, still very moving at a sna snail uh, snail like pace. Here's, here's one of the issues that, are, that has occasioned this uh, development. There happens to be the very challenging factor of, of, of challenging issue that we have regional economic communities like ECOWAS and EAC in East Africa that are doing very well on, on paper and in practice, as well as in, in, in terms of free movement. ECOWAS has had these free since 1979. EAC has been a bit more has been a bit better in the sense that the East Africa community has been running free movement um, since from 67 to 77 when it collapsed and then from 2000 when it started up until now when more countries have joined like Rwanda and now we're having DRC knocking, South Sudan is there, uh, Burundi is there uh, and so on. So the free movement, economic integration, when you look at the comparative, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, the com when you do a comp uh, compare and contrast, of um, uh, ECOWAS and EAC. And I'm referring to those two regional blocks specifically because SADC has had a, uh, a free movement protocol running since 2005 on paper. In practice, there are bilateral agreements. Member states do not move freely. They don't have this visa-free regime. And I, I can point to you many friends, acquaintances who still need to um, you know, prepare a visa before they move across SADC regions. Uh, they have relatives in one region and they're not able to move that kind of thing. Uh, in a a Arab Maghreb Union, there's too much chaos there. Morocco, Algeria, the, the issues there, they have bilateral agreements. Since that, we don't even need to go there. I know Dr. Mang Mangini talked about the AU RECs, there are eight of them running since 2006. But some of these regional economic communities are not fit for purpose. And I think the African continental free trade area has given the opportunity for regional economic communities to be a bit more introspective and look at whether they are fit for purpose. We have organizations like ECOWAS, uh, and sometimes I feel a bit uncomfortable when I'm outside the region uh, because there's a certain kind of exceptionalism with ECOWAS uh, that has come to stay because ECOWAS has been doing this, it's been doing that, it's been running, it's been quite successful. ECOWAS has its own challenges. We can speak to the issue of the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme, that has been running since the 1990s. Some say it's a mini African continental free trade area, but it still has challenges. Uh, member states are not always complying. There are issues with Nigeria. Benin, about two or three months ago, left the ETS. Uh, it had a lot number of complaints that uh, Nigeria, the, the made in Africa goods, the rules of origin was a challenge for them and so on. So there are issues with uh, uh, ECOWAS, the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme. And, and when you do a snapshot of how member states are fair and as far as free movement is concerned, we can clearly say that ECOWAS is doing well. We can also say the EAC is doing well as far as private sector engagement at the regional economic communities level, economic integration was concerned. We can't do much about SADEC, COMESA. COMESA is not uh, as bad as the others. In, in fact, COMESA is doing also very well. COMESA has a lot of best practices for AFTA, which, which has been carried over to the other RECs and so on. But Here's the issue. I think one, one of the important conversations that we need to have on this is the issue of migration. Migration. The African Continental Free Trade Area Policy Network, uh, the one I deputize for, happens to, um, we, we, we have a relationship with the IOM, a partnership which we re recently started in seeking to promote, uh, do some advocacy on the, on the freedom of movement protocol, precisely because of this atrocious, you know, uh, you know, a number of ratifications that we have. And the interesting thing is that we have 15 member states of ECOWAS. We have about seven or eight member states now of EAC. When you add that, that's how many countries? That's like 23 member states that should have been ratifying uh, the, the Freedom of Movement Protocol. Yet, I believe that even the Freedom of Movement Protocol, one of the members that has ratified is Chad. Chad is a member of ECAS and SAMAC. Uh, and, and Chad is a Central African country, which you would not necessarily think that it would want to uh, open up its borders, given the challenges that it is facing with the Sahel, 
Boko Haram, being in the multinational joint task force um, with the Lake Chad Basin Commission countries and so on, you, you may think that it would not be interesting uh, in, in signing up to the freedom of movement protocol because of these security challenges. Yet here you have Chad ratifying such a continental protocol. And you're asking yourself, why is it that ECOWAS, the, the ECOWAS countries are slow to do, to ratify, and EAC countries are also slow to ratify? And here's, here's the other important issue uh, uh, to, to, to consolidate the argument I was trying to raise, is that uh, about a year or two ago, uh, the AU in some of their meetings, they realized this very important conundrum, that ECOWAS and EAC should probably have been the low hanging fruits as far as freedom of movement protocol is concerned. And they have not been doing, uh, you know, doing their, their job adequately. So uh, the AU, I think in the special technicalized STC, the, that's the, the specialized technical commission meetings uh, that brings together member states argue, uh, looking at sector specific issues. They decided that West Africa and East Africa should actually come together either through the East Africa Legislative Assembly uh, the regional parliamentary uh, legislature in East Africa and the ECOWAS parliament, they could use the, the parliamentarians of these two regions to do advocacy around the freedom of movement protocol. To be, to be honest with you, I don't know how far this has gone, but uh, it's, it's, it, it, it is on paper that these two regions should be the one really promoting the freedom of movement protocol, given that at the regional level, they, they're doing it well. This has consequences for migration. The, we, Africa now has a, a uh, some may say a formidable migration governance architecture. We have uh, Morocco that has a, uh, a new institution of the AU um, looking at research uh, for migration. There's also one in South Sudan, the, then there's the other in Mali. These are three important institutions that going forward are going to seriously impact conversations around what some people call the mobility component of the African continental free trade area, which is this whole issue of freedom of movement protocol and migration. We cannot separate the two uh, because they are part and parcel of the very important conversation of movement. Here we are talking about trade, freedom of movement, integration, the cardinal things that make regional integration work are freedom of goods, people, capital, and services. And here's the case that people are not able to move freely. So how then do you expect services and goods cannot move on their own? If we want people, youth included. We have women who are doing cross-border trade. If we need them, and we are talking about Agenda 2063, uh, Aspiration 6, that talks about an inclusive and people-centered uh, Africa where women and people, women and youth are able to maximize their potential. And they have challenging uh, a freedom of movement protocol that member states are resistant to sign up to at the continental level, yet they're very happy to do it at the regional level, you begin to question how you're going to move forward. This is not to say that there are not solutions. The solution includes a lot of very important advocacy. Let me give you an example of what some of the important advocacy, uh, successful advocacy has been going on. We, uh, the AMA, that is the African Medicines Agency, which is supposed to help member states regulate drugs and this kind of thing, and especially in the context of COVID, this is the time when the African Medicines Agency, a new agency of the AU, is, is supposed to come about. We, we just last week had the 15th member state uh, ratifying. So we should move on to the final, final bits of identifying host country and then how it all works. Here it was the case that in April, we had one Michelle Sidibe, who used to work for UNAIDS, very, very competent professor. Uh, work uh, in, in, in Mali. He was appointed by the AU to be an envoy and, you know, right around the low-hanging fruits around member states that had not been able to sign the, free, the, the AMA uh, protocol. At the time, in April, there were about five or six member states that had only signed up to the uh, AMA. Within two months, Michel Sidibe, using his Twitter account, his uh, communication strategies and whatever else, had been able to rally Franco phone countries and countries signed up to the African Medicines Agency. And now we, we have an African Medicines Agency that should be running within hopefully in 2022. This is an example of what can be done with some of these AU protocols. The freedom of movement protocol 
I know speaking to some high level colleagues at the ECA, uh, I was told, and even, even some of the people at the IOM, uh, uh, the information is that they were, had been looking for quite a while. Quite why an envoy for the freedom of movement protocol, a very important part uh, protocol to the to to the uh, that has not been identified. This is, remains a mystery to some of us. You would think that uh, a priority might have been given to to identifying an envoy for this freedom of movement protocol to move with the speed in which people like Michel Sidibe. Uh, the special envoy for the AMA, African Medicines Agency, has moved. So clearly, there's there are best practices that can that indicate that show to us that there are possibilities and there's light at the end of the tunnel. But I think it's all about commitment and being serious uh, on, on on some of these things. The the the, the spaghetti ball uh, images and all these issues that we talk about variable geometry. I think at the end of the day, we need to get down to the ground and ask whether people really feel integration. Is it, I, 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 as someone who comes from ECOWAS and has had the privilege of traveling to some other regions outside ECOWAS, mm -hmm. I, I realized that in East Africa, for example, Emmanuel. there's a sense of commitment to East African integration. They feel Emmanuel. East African because of these opportunities of free movement. Yes, I can hear you, Philomena. Yes. Yes. Wrap up a bit. Yes. Yes, yeah. go, please go ahead. Um, Sorry to, to catch up, I was just watching the clock because we still need to laugh at QA. So thank you so much for your intervention. I, yes. I really enjoyed your intervention because you also have practical examples yeah. based on your own experience about how to navigate some of these issues. And indeed, you are right. If, it, yeah. if I even look at the, Af the, the, the heads of state champions, you know, why don't we have one that's really dedicated to the free movement of people? We have one on the AFCFTA. So these kind of questions, you know, yeah. I think are relevant to be asked. If we're looking for traction, what, yeah. what better way to have you know, an envoy, a head of state who's actually dedicated to go around to get ratifications on this protocol. And, and you have mentioned, of course, key issues that, yes, we do need to think realistically about mobility of people, uh, movement of goods, capital and people are key to, to be able to have trade within our, uh, the, 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 the continent. But of course, in, in, yeah. our, in our study, we, we also heard that, you know, free movement of services is not free movement of people. So there's the tendency to make a distinction between services which are temporary vis-a-vis -vis movement of people, which also has rights of establishment and is quite permanent. So some 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 member states are not ready to open up because they are, they're not really ready to push to go that far, I think, at the moment. But I I, I think Dr. Francis wanted to react to some of your um presentation, some some of your, your your shared insights. So I'll give him the floor before I open it up to QA. Dr. Francis? Yeah, the, yeah just, just briefly, I just wanted to um, make, the, make the following observation. That when talking about free movement of people uh, in Africa, for that matter, yes, we can talk about the African protocol on the African passport and free movement, which would actually make a requirement for visas uh, illegal on the continent for uh, holders of African passports. Yes, we can talk about that. But I wanted to mention what you have just mentioned there, that we need also to bear in mind that under the African Continent of Free Trade Area Agreement, there's a protocol on trading services under which there is a, a track for liberalizing trading services, which include movement of the uh, natural persons. Now, though this may be temporary, it is still meaningful. It is still quite significant under mod 4. That protocol also covers establishment of commercial presence. That's investments where there can be intra-corporate transferees. So negotiations on the, uh, opening up our markets for natural persons are actually ongoing. And I think we can welcome that as well. But perhaps equally significant or even slightly more significant is the fact that a number of African countries have autonomously uh, opened up their markets to free movement or their countries to free movement. They have either abolished the visa requirements for African passport holders or they grant visas on arrival. And there's also the possibility of having, uh, of getting e-visas e in fact. 44% uh, of our countries now grant e-visas e for that matter. So I think this can be welcome. And uh, the countries that uh, are autonomously liberalizing free movement of persons include small ones like Seychelles, which, as you may know, 
has a population of only about 97,000 people. Yes, you have to be right, 97,000 people. You can feel them in a stadium. Yeah, they have opened up. But they also include other countries such as Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Ghana, and so on and so forth. So I think we can look comprehensively you know, at the picture. We can have a comprehensive view of the situation and try to, um, shall I say, catalyze effort towards uh, ratification of this protocol. I believe we have only need two more uh, ratifications for this protocol to enter in force. Uh, maybe we need to check the figures, but uh, uh, we are almost there. And once we get the protocol to enter into force, uh, just about 15 ratifications are required. Uh, then we shall have uh, made an important beginning uh, on this journey of uh, free movement of persons on the continent. So that's what I wanted to say, Philo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for, for definitely giving us uh, these key, key figures in terms of visa Thank on you. arrival. If, if I may, yes. yeah, if, if, if I may yes. Um, submit, yes. Th th thank you very much, Dr. Mangini, for your, for, for, for for the uh, inside there, uh, the 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 other thing is that um, I think last year, I think fifteenth October last year, the International Organization for Migration launched the first ever uh, African Migration Report. Now there was one chapter in there, uh, chapter six. Uh, I was privy to have been part of a webinar that was featured around chapter six last year. Chapter six is critical because it speaks to securitization of challenges around freedom of movement protocol, which has been probably the biggest stumbling block around freedom of movement uh, among uh, AU member states. And it's not difficult to point to securitization when we look at regions like Central Africa. SEMAC may be a region uh, that is doing well economically uh, with the six member states that exist there. Uh, uh, but we, we also know that ECAS has, has had some, some significant challenges. The free, freedom of movement has not been as, uh, as, as free as compared to some of the other regions. We know countries like Gabon, um, we know of, of, of the other uh, member countries in, in its neighborhood that have struggled to open up their borders. Uh, I, I know, for example, that in 2014, the ECA is even trying to rationalize the uh, SEMAC and ECAS to the point where it would become one entity and uh, maybe SEMAC may be, would, would become, uh, uh, you know, an agency of ECAS as because ECAS does peace and security very well in the sub-region and in, in that region and so on. So significant challenges in regions like Central Africa. And one of the biggest things for them has always been security. When I open up my border, uh, Gabon, for example, is an oil producer, as we know. We have Equatorial Guinea as well. What is the likelihood that some of the migrants from one border will cross over to come and seek jobs at the expense of the citizens there? These have been some of the perennial conversations that have been going on for, for years in regions like Central Africa, whereas somehow in West Africa, uh, those kind of conversations uh, were subsumed by conversations that West Africans like to move more freely, so let's just open the borders. Uh, with the irony being that at the, the time that uh, free, free visa-free regime was established in, in West Africa in 79, uh, pre-Schengen, mind you, Schengen was around 85, this came at a time when uh, you had the hard men of, of West Africa, the, 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 you know, the dictators, uh, the irony of it all, you can imagine. So here's the case that uh, security time and, and it's going forward, I think it's something that we need to begin to unpack well. We begin, okay. we need to begin to get member states to unlearn that, uh, you know, you can open your borders for, 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 for people to move freely, but also tighten your security. Thank you so much. We know that in Europe, uh, 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 Europe, Europe was established at the time of Treaty of Maastricht. So, thank I mean, I think Emmanuel. there are solutions that can be done. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you. you. You definitely have highlighted a, a key question that I even see from the, the audience. Mr. Soji, or Ms. Soji, uh, did mention that the fragility of most economies at the top of the list. So your, your, your intervention is very valid. At this moment, uh, since time is running out, I would like to delve into the Q&A session of this webinar. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Bruce Byers, who's the head of our African Institutions and Metodynamics Program at ECDPM.
and he has been monitoring the chat for some of the questions which will address the speakers. Bruce, yeah. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for the participation and the good questions. Um, I think, I mean, obviously, some of our speakers have already been looking or, or seeing and managing to address some of the questions. But since we have little time, maybe I have four basic sort of groups that we can maybe have one last round with, with their speakers. One specific question is around what is the current status of the rules of origin negotiations for the CFTA, where maybe Francis uh, can just give a very brief update. There's another group of questions which also came out of Wumi's presentation and also some of the discussions here, um, basically on this idea of, of variable geometry. So, I mean, the, the, there was the question about, okay, the customs unions will now be part of this platform, but it still remains that among the RECs, as has been raised, whether it's free movement or trade, they're in very different statuses. So is it possible really to have one mechanism for such a variation of, of uh, regional bodies? Or does there need to be some kind of almost like an ad hoc uh, specific agreement with each different regional body? Uh, and how feasible is that? I mean, there's a, there's a point made by, uh, I think it's Sotetsi, Macon, I mean, pushing for rationalization. But that's part of the discussion here. Is it really politically feasible to have a rationalization or sort of ad hoc bodies per rec? Um, on the free movement of people, I guess one of the sort of uh, Emmanuel has, has addressed lots of the points sort of about how to help accelerate ratifications. There's the proposal from uh, Alan Hirsch saying perhaps a good idea would be a technical committee focused precisely on this connection. So as well as the envoy suggestion, might that be something that would be a practical solution? Um, and there's a point there again about the political resistance and, and, and how politically feasible is it actually on, these, on the free movement uh, agenda? I mean, one question that I would have there is, to what degree are these two very similar agendas? In one hand, they seem to be exactly the same thing, but on the other hand, what we see is lots of uh, unilateral opening up as, as has been mentioned. So, in fact, should the trade, the, the free movement perhaps be seen more as a bottom up agenda and, and, and trade can be more of a kind of a structural one. And then the final question, which was made right at the start, uh, but it also links with another one about sort of the different actors involved here. I mean, what is the role of external actors here? There's obviously a, a large amount of negotiation that still needs to take place to kind of disentangle these different things. Uh, where do the, the external partners come in who often themselves need kind of a clear vision of structures we can support here, we can support there. Um, so how, how can they be sort of part of this very sort of flexible moving uh, agenda? And again, the, the point from Soji Awagbadi about the, the role of private sector. Um, Francis mentioned the idea of bringing them into this, this, this continental platform. Uh, I guess there's a kind of a question though of sort of how can you have more representation within those discussions. So back to you, uh, Philo. So that's sort of these four questions on the actors involved, free movement of people uh, in terms of sort of other ways forward, variable geometry and politics, and on the rules of origin. So, but we haven't heard from Wumi for a while. So Wumi is available. Maybe Wumi can can take a first shot and then I hand back to Philomena. Thank you so much, Bruce, for, 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 for that uh, good summary of the questions we've had so far. So I think uh, you, you're definitely right. We haven't had from Wumi in a while. So Wumi, the first question would go to you in terms of the variable geometry and how you see this being implemented in practice. You, you did already mention that the RECs are heterogeneous in their, in their uh, composition. So how would you see in practice um, some of these issues being addressed? given the, the fact that the AFCFT allows for verbal geometry. That's all with me. Oh, okay. Phenomena, thank you very much. You know, at this point in time, I think I need to refer to the study of UDECA on the building the interface mm -hmm. between the regional economic communities and the AFCFT. All these issues were well documented and analyzed. Sometimes when people are discussing the issue of regional economic community, I can see element of simplicity in terms of the complexity and the dynamics of this organization. And also the complexity in terms of the implementation of the custom unions. And if I want to discuss them today, <laughs> I don't think we are going to finish this webinar. But I will refer us 
to that study by UNECA. But I think, I don't know why UNECA has not published it, or for some of us, if we can be able to be privy to the information. A whole chapter, many chapters were devoted to solve these specific issues, the variable geometry, the variable speed, and the implementation of custom union. Let me quickly say this. Whether we like it or not, sometimes I used to say, let us live with our problem. We have the challenges of this kind of uh, unequal opportunity and so on and so forth. So when you have the postal union, the question we need to ask ourselves, is it postal union in principle or postal union in practice? If you look at that study, it's clearly shown there's no postal union in Africa that is functioning well. It's either they are partial custom union or they are custom union in transition. So we made some kind of policy recommendation. And the kind of policy recommendation is let us be implementing AFCFTU and use that platform to encourage the regional economic community to implement the custom union. There are many gray areas. There are many, I mentioned some the other time. In that study, if you use FO as an example, there are many non conforming tariff lines. And you can be able to see that even the average tariff increased, even with the implementation of CET. That shows that that thing is not fully, is not well implemented. But there are some institutional arrangements and the way that it can be done. And that is why that study proposed some kind of arrangements that can be put in place in order to be able to manage. All the regional economic communities and even the custom union in practice. That's what I'm saying. This issue of rationalization as well. So for me, I want to see that we can develop a synergy in such a way that regional economic communities will be part of the implementation of ASCFT and they will not see themselves as a parallel institution. Immediately, the regional economic communities see them as a parallel institution. That means AFCFT is creating another layer. And that is what we need to avoid. So here, I want to recommend just what I would say, the principle of programmatic gradualism. This association, let us base it on program and be able to specify some time that we, this thing can be implemented. Then we can be able to see how various institutions can be, can be involved in the implementation. And a good example is there our boosting traffic the country. There are action plans there that we can use and the framework of the AU can be used in order to resolve that kind of, uh, of challenges. On the issue of enforcement, what I can be able to say here is that, why can't we learn from the regional economic community? Let's look at, for example, this free movement of people that we are talking about. ECOWAS is somehow ahead. What is ECOWAS doing that others are not doing? So if we can be able to, is it possible for us to scale up the activities of everyone? And if we can be able to achieve some of those fundamental, uh, we are there some fundamental challenges of free movement. That is what, just what I want to suggest. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wumi, for sharing that. Indeed, you've given us some practical ways to move forward. You know, if we're thinking about the variable geometry, but also rationalization, we need to be able to see the regs as part and parcel of the institution, not parallel, not parallel in the implementation. I, I will move quickly on because I see we're out of time. So I beg, please, for, for 10 more minutes of your time so we can get through the questions for those of you who want to stay on. And I will move quickly to Dr. Francis to give us the status of the rules of origin, where they are now, and maybe also to answer what roles for donors and how to get more private sector involved because this, the, these two are also crucial to the implementation process. Thank you. Uh, right. So we, we have done now 88% of the tariff lines. They have rules of origin now. What is outstanding is the automotive sector and then the textile and clothing sectors. These are the two main areas which are still outstanding. So this is very good progress. Now, secondly, I would like to suggest that um, Though we have been using the expression rationalization, and though we have even started talking about some ad hoc arrangements between the between some regs and the FCFTA secretariat, I'd like to very strongly suggest 
that we look at this in terms of convergence, program convergence. We focus more on getting the whole of Africa to have a single trade and investment regime, which then the member states or state parties can implement, irrespective of which rec they are in. This is the only way forward because the vision of Africa is to be a single form, a, a common market. We want a single African market. And uh, we cannot begin having, you know, you know, pockets of different regimes that uh, complicate things. So could we move away from this idea of rationalization and just focus on con convergence or program harmonization? Now, regarding partners, and we don't like to call them donors, really, I want to call them partners. Uh, we would like them to come and support our programs. And as I said, maybe twice already, there is enough room for everybody, every person of goodwill who wants to assist. But it should be in terms of supporting existing programs rather than the tail wagging the dog. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Now, lastly, could I just mention that uh, the while governments make regulations or policy, uh, the users are the private sector or industry, the ordinary persons, both natural and companies. So the private sector industry have a very important role and therefore they will be mainstreamed through decision making at all levels. And that's why we have continental organizations and they, they have a fundamental role at the national level to inform national positions as well as the implementation and the utilization. Uh, since we have run out of time, maybe that's all I can say and leave it at this. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for, for sharing this indeed. Uh, there is space for, 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 for development partners to support. I like how you phrase it. It should be for existing frameworks so that the AU priorities are actually the ones that, that are being supported. And as well as the private sector, yes, we do have, for example, Afro Champions and the African Business Council who have been key, I think, in this whole process in trying to shed light for the private sector um, needs moving forward with the implementation process. So thank you for sharing this. And then I will go now to the final question, I think, which which I will ask to Emmanuel, and this is on the free movement of Portugal. So we've been speaking about, you know, how to make this more concrete in terms of the um, uh, free movement amongst the different RECs vis-a-vis -vis the, the AFCFTA. So what are your thoughts about a joint technical committee between the AU and RECs on technical issues related to the free movement of Portugal? Hi. Uh, thank you, Philomena. I, th I think that's a great idea. I think at the end of the day, RECs are here to stay. Uh, so I think we should, um, in the context and conversation of after, we should do our very best as uh, civil society organizations uh, uh, and other organizations engaging the after secretariat uh, and, and partners to find our ways in which we can have a, a, a clear appreciation of the roles that uh you know the rex have now that AFTA is here um I, I, at the end of the day the african continental free trade area um people have said is a game changer and it truly is but even as that may be the case we need to bear in mind that AFTA isn't the only game in town there have been many au protocols and processes that have been running for years AFTA has come as an opportunity to now rejig the conversation on Africa's regional integration so that we get to the stage where uh, we can truly say that uh, Africa's integration has come of, come of age. After the end of the day, it's only one of the many protocol, many uh, flagship programs of the of, of uh, Agenda 2063. We need to make it work. And freedom of movement protocol, as has been exemplified by the uh, African passport, uh, which is supposed to be promoted. These are some of the things that need to come to life now that AFTA is here. A committee linking these up and a conversation, a harmonized conversation, would definitely do justice to the very important conversation um, that AFTA has come to present to us. So that, that, that would be my take on it. I think it's a great idea. We, we shouldn't wish away the RECs. We should seek to build and improve it. The key is there. We need to build and improve upon the RECs and identify some of the challenges they have so that we can, we can work and ensure that they work for the respective regions. It shouldn't just be a case of, one region working well for the other and uh, the others just they are there they need to work and i think after needs to be that stick or uh, to 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 really uh, uh, encourage that that new development 
Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for, for, for this. In fact, yes, thank you so much, Emmanuel, for this. You have definitely given us uh, some food for thought going forward in terms of the institutional framework of this. But maybe just as we're at 1234 in the last minute, maybe just to ask you what role do you see for the private sector in also helping move the free movement protocol? And I'll just give you a minute and a half to answer this. Okay, well, well the, the role of the private sector is very, very critical critical in the sense that we, we cannot have a functioning re, uh, after without an empowered private sector. Uh, le let me just say that even as we speak, there's going to be an Africa Private Sector Summit conference in Africa next week, uh, where we're bringing, about the, we're bringing down to town some of the big guns uh, uh, who will come to speak of their experiences, the big conversations, what are they doing in, 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 in specific spaces. And the private sector is is now being uh, in that conversation, looking at how the Africa Private Sector Summit is going to link up with academia to ensure that uh, the private sector is empowered, that the chambers of commerce come into the conversation, because the chambers of commerce now are also the front line, uh, or they should be the front line of conversations on private sector. So that's the Africa Private Sector Summit. Uh, After Policy Network is part of the coordinating organizations that are, that is. Uh, running this conference is 19th to 22nd in Accra. You can follow it on Zoom, uh, Africa Private Sector Summit.org. And there's going to be a lot of conversation on AFTA, uh, on Rex, uh, and on, on also what some of the other organizations and stakeholders are doing and what needs to be done to improve and bring about a, a, an empowered private sector. Uh, there has been tr tremendous uh, um, uh, movement and, and, and outcomes coming from this, including the development of a of a, the draft private sector bill for member states of the EU. Lawyers are working on it at the moment. EC has adopted consultants who will work on these with the lawyers to ensure that this draft bill for the private sector is circulated among EU member states to ensure that a private sector now not just empowered, but does the need for to make sure that, that they can also input right into the uh, into the after conversation. So much, Emmanuel, for this. In fact, I, I think that's 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 the part of the conversation that we we needed to hear. In fact, because we've been focusing more on the regs and the institutions, but private sector, you know, as a, a is, is also very important, and it's good to see that there's some development to actually have them have meaningful um, participation in this whole process. So we'll be we we'll definitely watching to hear more about the Africa Private Sector Summit coming up uh, in, in in a few days' time. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying this long. I know we're seven minutes over time, but I want to thank you so much for participating in this first of the webinar series. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Wumi, Dr. Francis and Emmanuel for sharing the insights. And of course, to my colleague, Amanda Bisong for her wonderful presentation that set the tone for today's discussions, for Bruce Bias for helping as well with the, with, with the Q&A and for all the other technical support of OBCDPM. Just to remind you that this is only the first in a webinar series of three. We have two more webinars planned under our broad thing of connecting markets and people. The second one will be held on 29th October. So please look, look out for our adverts of this on social media, but also we'll send some of you some, some, some invitations to attend. It's, it's going to be looking at the AFCFCA and the continent to continent trade with the European Union. I thank you all. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to Amanda. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, everyone. And I wish you all a lovely day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philomena. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Bye.